Third um, Institute for Public Policy, who regrets that he's unable to join us tonight due to some unforeseen international travel delays. So um, that's, that's the life of an ambassador. Yeah, uh, the program this evening brings together successful academic partnership within Rice University with the Baker Institute Health Policy Forum and the Jones Partners Thought Leadership Series of the Jones Graduate School of Business. The James A. Baker III Institute of Public Policy is a nonpartisan organization focusing on the study, formulation, execution, and criticism of public policy. The Jones Partners is a committed group of business leaders working to open doors and build ties between the Jesse H. Jones Graduate School of Business and the business community. This evening also represents a broader association of Rice University with the Texas Medical Center and a common commitment to human health. The March um, 2010 Patient Protection and Affordable um, Care Act is the most complicated and controversial piece of health of healthcare legislation since Medicare and Medicaid were introduced almost 50 years ago. Now that we've reached the one year anniversary of the act's passage, policymakers are deeply embroiled in the law's implementation. There are multiple constitutional challenges to the act's mandate for individuals to purchase healthcare insurance. There are efforts by some members of Congress to defund the law. And some states argue that the act's requirements to expand Medicaid program will bankrupt them. Tonight's panel's discussion will examine the implications of healthcare reform for business. Certainly, the healthcare, American healthcare system requires reform because healthcare costs are skyrocketing and now comprise 17% of the gross domestic product. But will the Affordable Health Care Act restrain this cost? Will businesses be helped or hurt by the ACA's provisions? And how will healthcare reform affect the economy? Tonight, we'll hear from three experts who understand healthcare sector, who have followed healthcare reform closely, and who know what business leaders demand from healthcare industry. So thank you for attending this event tonight and for exploring the implications of healthcare reform for the future of business in America. Vitally important topic. But now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. George McLennan, um, who's, the, who's the Howard, a. Howard R. Hughes Provost and Professor of Chemistry at Rice University. He joined us in uh, July of this past year. And as the university's chief academic officer, the provost promotes and supports excellence in all dimensions of the university's academic, research, scholarly, and creative programs and activities. Dr. McClellan was, was previously the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Duke University, a position he assumed in July of 04. He was also professor of chemistry and professor of biochemistry and experimental cancer therapeutics in the School of Medicine. Texas native, he received his BS from the University of Texas at El Paso and his PhD from Texas A&M. Dr. McLennan is certainly no stranger to the business world. He has founded several biotechnology startup companies, including Tetralogic Pharmaceuticals, which works on cancer diagnostics and therapeutics. Is also a champion for a major healthcare initiative for Rice University, including the Bioscience Research Collaborative. Uh, please join me in welcoming um, Professor, Provost uh, George McClendon to the podium. Thanks, Bill, for that gracious introduction, which I will now make completely anticlimactic since my entire role is to introduce three people. Um, <laughs> So thank you all for coming tonight. I personally am looking forward to uh, an extraordinary dialogue and interaction with three transformational healthcare leaders. Uh, let me start with, Mike, with uh, Mr. Michael McAllister, who is the CEO of Humana, uh, arguably one of, if not the most important healthcare insurer and now healthcare provider in the country. I, he, he's also the longest, running, the longest running CEO in the Fortune 100, which tells you something about his running skills. Um, uh, he'll be joined on the panel by uh, Dr. John Mendelson. Uh, many of us in the Houston community know John as, as a truly transformational leader for MD Anderson, 
where he's built uh, the MD Anderson Cancer Center into the top, the top rated cancer center in the nation year after year after year in his 15 years in that role. Uh, John is uh, stepping back, he, he, he says, from working 80 hours a week to only working 40 hours and a half week. Uh, so we're looking forward to that transition and to interacting with John Moore in his, in his uh, connecting role to Rice. And last but not least, Rice's own Dr. Vivian Ho, um, one of the nation's preeminent healthcare economists, who uh, is, creates ties between the economics department, the Baker Institute, and the Baylor College of Medicine, and sort of epitomizes the kind of multidisciplinary activities that are uniquely possible in the uh, Texas Medical Center. Uh, I could go on and on about the extraordinary accomplishments of each of these individuals, but it would take away from what you really came here for, which is to hear them speak. So without further ado, let me let me turn things over to our panelists. I think, I think I'm first. Thank you. I'm not sure if I'm the oldest, longest running Fortune 100 CEO, but I feel like it. Uh, the uh, 11 years is a long time. I think the average tenure is five and a half or something like that. So I'm way past my cell date. So this may be the last time you ever see me. So thanks for having me here tonight. I, <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to come to Rice. Um, I did spend, I think, more time in Washington in the two years before healthcare reform was passed than the president did. He was running for office most of that time, and I was there in Washington trying to figure out what was going to happen. So, you know, I often say, uh, you know, I might be wrong, but I'm not confused. So I'll share with you what I believe is going on at this point. Uh, and we don't know what's going on completely because the rules have not been written yet for a 2,000 plus bill. I'm sure it will fill this room or they will fill this room before we're finished. But it is a work in progress. Uh, just a, two, two minutes about Humana. We are a reasonably good sized company. We have about 11 million people we do business with on some level, about 34 billion in annual revenues. We're a big player in the Medicare Advantage space and in Part D, so we've grown to, uh, to love working with our government every day. Uh, but it's been a wonderful program, and I'll talk a little bit about the implications of that to business in just a minute. Uh, we've set out for our company something that might sound sort of strange coming from a health insurance company. And it's basically that we're dedicated to helping people achieve lifelong well-being. This whole concept of well-being is really being hyped right now, and you're hearing it from all sorts of participants. I don't care what their roles are, uh, but I think there's something in it. I think there's a wave coming around this, and I would argue even more importantly that it's absolutely critical to actually solving the problem, uh, as opposed to much of what's been done so far. Um, we recently, in this whole space of well-being, announced a joint venture we're doing with a company called Vitality in the U.S., which is a subsidiary of a South African company named Discovery, which I think has the most uh, mature, organized, and robust um, wellness and well-being platform tied to incentives and rewards that I've seen anywhere in the world. So we're excited about that concept of bringing some new ideas into healthcare to bring around behavior change. And I'll come back to it because I think that's the absolute key to what we're going to be dealing with here. First of all, in healthcare reform, it doesn't happen real fast. We're in the early um, phases of this thing. It really comes in two big buckets, what happened last year and this year. And you've seen all this in the paper, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we began to, uh, to close some of the cracks relative to coverage. Children under 19 are being uh, treated differently. We can keep our kids on our plans till they're 26. Uh, preventive care is now fully covered. Uh, there's expense requirements for people like us in the business that we have to spend a certain amount of dollars uh, out, of, or out of every $100. It depends on the product line. And then we begin the process of closing the donut hole for seniors. In the midterm, we have an individual mandate coming, although as you've seen, that's been debated and whether it survives or not is very much up in the air. There's something called exchanges that are going to happen. We're likely to end up with 51 versions of these things because they're being done at the state level. Although a handful of states have already told the federal government, you do it, we're not interested. Uh, generally, they're led by Republicans. Uh, there's taxes coming to the system uh, across the, uh, the, the uh, insured part of the business, not all of it. Uh, quality bonuses are being put into healthcare for the first time uh, that'll, that'll work through people like us to try to be able to measure quality and start paying for such things. And the definition of quality is always up in the air, but there are some things evolving here. Uh, 
transition of Medicare payment rates uh, to people like us again are going to be occurring during this period of time. Over the long haul, we do end up with 30 million approximately newly covered people. The donut hole gets completely closed. And in theory, the federal deficit gets reduced by $124 billion. For the business people in the room, that $124 billion is coming to you because it's basically, basically coming out of the Medicare program. And as we know, the way the shifting of costs work in the system is the private sector is the safety valve for everything relative to federal and state government programs. So don't be fooled by the math here. Uh, it's not all good news from a business perspective because the business group will ultimately see these costs coming their direction. There's the good and the bad and the ugly of all this. We do have coverage expanded. It's a very good policy thing. I think at this point we could all agree on that. Again, the children are covered. Pre-existing conditions disappear over time. And I will tell you, if you really poll the American public and ask them what's the biggest fear they have of health care, this is actually it. That somehow they have a pre-existing condition and they fall through the cracks, get lost in the system, and they can see themselves becoming bankrupt instantly. That's the biggest fear. Full coverage for prevention again, uh, no restrictions for fraud, there's some uh, energy around that. Uh, really good news in that the Medicare database is going to be set free. I argued with the previous administration for eight years that was the best database in the U.S. <clears throat> if we're ultimately going to start measuring quality off of good data and giving people insight and transparency to what happens, we need this data turned loose into the private sector for people to do good work with it. Finally, we're down that path, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, administrative simplification uh, is something that comes to the insurance market, which we could all agree is a good thing to do. And again, the Part D donut hole gets closed. The bad, <clears throat> there's not equal tax treatment for insurance out there. If you're buying it individually on your own in the marketplace, you use after-tax dollars. If you're getting it at work, you use pre-tax dollars. There's nothing basically fair about that, but that was not fixed. The individual mandate has such minor fines associated with it, I think it's likely to be ineffective. So whether it goes or stays, I'm, I'm not sure, is going to change much of the outcome. Uh, the industry is going to be taxed. So if the concept was to lower the cost of health insurance to people, putting taxes on the health insurance didn't seem to be the most uh, important thing to do. But that's what happened here. And then Medicare Advantage gets cut uh, with higher and ends up with higher premiums, lower benefits for seniors, and that sort of thing. The ugly is, I would have argued when we went into this, there were two big goals of health care reform. And we'd also, we changed it to health insurance reform in July of 2009, by the way. We got away from the health care piece. But at the end of the day, we were looking for universal coverage and lower cost. We will still have 20 million people uninsured when all of this is completely implemented and in place. And I, th I think there's consensus that what efforts exist in the bill to really do something about cost are pretty minor at best. So our basic problem is the same. Health care costs too much, and it's rising too fast. I won't spend a lot of time on this sheet because it's about Medicare, but I would argue that uh, for those of you that are large employers in the room, uh, you should be looking very hard at your, at your retirees in terms of what the uh, opportunity may look like relative to Medicare for your people. But in any case, I can tell you, and I mentioned it earlier, as we get further into this, any costs that have to be recaptured in any part of this rollout are going to find their way into the private sector rates and into the premiums for, for, uh, for business. So it's all coming your way. This is what happened in the election. Uh, a lot of shifting. You've seen this played out. I would take you to the bottom of this and basically say I think the chance of any r realistic repeal is about zero. Uh, we're going to see a lot more oversight hearings, and you're beginning to see that already happen. Legal challenges are underway. <clears throat> we have, we have um, verdicts on both ends. So I think that's uncertain, and I think uh, there will be an effort to get it to the Supreme Court uh, quicker as opposed to later. And then state, states are beginning to work on implementation of this bill. Companies like ours are doing the same thing. At any one point in time, I probably have 750 people that are working on implementation, despite not having all the rules and regulations promulgated at this point. But there's a full, full court press to get this done. It is the law of the land, and we're all going about implementing it as fast as we can, assuming no major changes. Uh, and yet we'll have to see how that plays out in Washington. Looking ahead, this is where I want to spend just, uh, some time because I think this is uh, the, the critical question about the long term. What are we going to do about the health status of Americans and the ultimate costs that are associated with our deteriorating health? Obesity is sweeping the country. 
a third of all children are already obese. We know it. The doctors in the room know what's coming next. We're going to have diabetes that follows that and everything that goes with that. So um, we, we, know what cost, we know what costs money. We know what drives health care costs. There's five chronic conditions that generate about 80% of all health care costs in the U.S., and all five of them are preventable. Having said that, we don't really know what it takes to get behavior change and to get the public to take care of themselves. And we've been told for decades what we need to do to be healthy. We all know. Quit smoking, quit drinking so much, quit eating so much, and get some exercise. That's the magic formula to health, and yet it's not happening. So obviously knowing what the right thing is is not enough. So we can reform all the insurance stuff we want to do, and we can change the markets, and there's a lot of reasons to do some of the things that have been done here for a lot of good reasons. Let's do it. But we're going to have to move to a new place relative to health care and health status, or none of it's going to really matter at the end of the day. So I think we need to move from covering sickness to creating well-being. Uh, that's a term out there that is still relatively vague, but it's something we're working on. I think positive, voluntary, and sustainable consumer behavior modification is the key. Um, Humana's approach, ours is, to try to innovation across all these sort of things mm -hmm. with a real simple cliche, and maybe it is a cliche, but I think it's a real thing that's going to be important over time to get people to actually do something. You know, making fun things healthy and healthy things fun. This has to become more interesting. People's interaction, inter interaction with healthcare today is all negative. It's not a good event. And I think we're going to have to change the way people think about it and interact to make it better. Connectivity is key. I was asked in Washington once in a while, somebody would stop me and say, well, if you were king for a day, what would you do? And my answer was always the same. I would digitize all of health care. Because as soon as you get digitization, you do, in fact, have a system of sorts. And what comes with the system? Process improvement, continuous quality measurement, metrics, and all the things that we know everywhere else in this economy are quite effective in making changes. And then lastly, I think we need to change our language a little bit. Uh, return on well-being is the way we're beginning to think about things at Humana as opposed to return on investment. Uh, I think there's a real case to be made for businesses to invest in well-being with their employees. Uh, that case is being built, and the evidence is building that it can actually work. This is ultimately what it's going to take, in my opinion, to do something about health care. In the meantime, uh, we will do what we need to from a market uh, uh, transformation. We will implement the law. Uh, we will continue to build uh, capabilities, but I think at the end of the day, we have to find a way to get people engaged in their own health and change the way they interact with the system when they do need it. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Well, good evening. That's about as good a summary as you're going to hear of the state of things. Uh, from the point of view of um, one of the largest providers of health care in the country, and I'm going to look through a little different lens, and that's the lens of an academic medical center. Uh, the one that I happen to be uh, managing is the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. So I'm going to give you a few uh, background slides about us and then get into some of these same issues. Uh, we wrote a vision statement about 13 years ago uh, to be the premier cancer center in the world based on the excellence of our people, our research-driven uh, patient care, and our science. And indeed, as uh, was generously pointed out, uh, we are consistently, consistently ranked number one now as a cancer hospital, uh, moving fairly far ahead in the uh, normalized score of the second place institution where I used to work for 11 years, and it's a wonderful cancer center. But I'm glad that uh, number one is right here in Houston. <clears throat> this is an imperfect measure of uh, excellence, but uh, there is no perfect one, so we're happy with it. Uh, we have grown tremendously. <laughs> Over the past uh, 15 years, uh, these, the numbers on the left are the uh, the bold statistics, uh, $3 billion budget down at the bottom, which looks small compared to Humana, but it's large for any one institution that's delivering uh, medical care. The right-hand side's the important one. The increase in the number of patients we've served and the number of new patients, uh, the patients on clinical trials, the research expenditures, you can work your way down, the trainees, the facilities, all two to fourfold increase. Uh, we are a state institution. The state provides 6% of our budget today. 
uh, it provided almost none of the funds needed to do all of that expansion. Uh, the research expansion did benefit from some state help, but all of the clinical expansion was reinvestment of the revenues that we generated taking care of patients and the margins we made over and above our costs. And that's the challenge we face today. All of this growth, incidentally, was demand-driven. There are a lot of people that want to come for cancer care. Forty percent of us in this room are going to be told we have cancer sometime in our lifetimes. Unfortunately, we're living longer in this. We're fortunately, we're living longer, but unfortunately, that means there's going to be more cancer. Now, this is how MD Anderson is organized. <coughs> the blue is how we uh, uh, manage care, and the center is what we've done most of the time diagnosing and treating cancer. And you can see there's an emphasis on well-being at our institution. On the left, prevention. On the right, survivorship. Two-thirds of patients live five years or longer. And you can see the list of things they're interested in, and it's the same whether you're on the prevention side or on the survivorship side. And in the, uh, yeah, good, it's orange color almost burnt orange. Uh, there's uh, uh, the organization of our research. These institutes are academic departments and centers of excellence. And in the uh, left-hand lower side, you see the Duncan Family Institute for Prevention and Risk Assessment. And when I give my talks, I say that if we want to reduce cancer deaths, about 40% of it's going to come from changing lifestyle. And it's the same list of four that you already heard from Mike. Uh, smoking, diet, uh, an exercise, uh, or the, what's the fourth? Oh, drinking, that's true. <laughs> A glass of red wine every day is good for you for cancer. <laughs> but uh, drinking isn't, isn't as major a factor as the other three in cancer, but it is a factor. And uh, the other 60% depends on uh, uh, better diagnostic technologies and better treatments, but 40% is a lot, and uh, I agree with his statement that modifying behavior is a lot tougher than cloning genes, and we have not figured out how to modify behavior. Now, uh, why must <coughs> our revenues exceed our costs? And this is true for MD Anderson. It's true for any place that delivers care, but at academic medical centers, there's more of it. Uh, academic medical centers take care of over half of the indigent care in the United States. Uh, we do not cover our costs with Medicaid or with Medicare, and that's not unique to us. Uh, a great deal of the research we do, especially with patients, clinical trials, <clears throat> when we're the largest uh, clinical research program in the country, uh, offering new therapies to cancer patients who, where standard therapy hasn't failed. A good bit of that is unfunded, uh, and we have to provide that. Uh, there's tremendous unfunded education and training aspects, and we're training nurses, x-ray technicians, as well as doctors and uh, scientists. Uh, the infrastructure and equipment in, in a cancer hospital with all the PET scanners and CAT scanners requires funding. IT is something we ought to be spending at least 10% of our budget on. That would be $300 million a year. We're not, and uh, we're probably going to end up paying for it, but we hope paying for it in the bad sense, not in putting out the cash, but we're hoping the federal government will figure out a way to have a standardized <coughs> information technology that we can all use together. And uh, Mike's answer to this was to uh, have a, a, uh, an IT system that records all health care, but it has to be interchangeable between all of us that are delivering the care or it's not worthwhile. I got to be able to mail our information off to the Mass General and out to San Francisco on the same format, totally compatible. And uh, that is a long way from happening. Uh, we need new facilities and we need to fund growth. So this is why we need margins. Now we're in the perfect storm in 2011. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid payment rates Every year they threaten to drop the Medicare and then they postpone it for another year. But uh, the budget that uh, President Obama put forth, part of that billion dollars, uh, $120 uh, uh, billion we're gonna save, involves cutting Medicare payments substantially. 
And if you believe that's going to happen, I've got a bridge to sell you. So uh, that takes care of, I think, $400 million out of the billion. But they are planning to cut Medicare pay, uh, uh, payments. Insurance payments rates are going down. The cost shifting isn't only to the businesses in the United States. The cost shifting is to the insurance companies. They have paid us more than our actual costs in order to cover all those things on that other list. Uh, their attitude now is we better just stick to paying you for your cost to your care and you figure out a way to grow and pay for the research and the infrastructure and all that because the government's pointing their finger at the insurance companies and saying you're charging too much. State funding is going to go down 15 percent. That's another source of our money. And federal support for research is flat or decreasing, and it's been that case for four or five years. And then in 2014 begins this influx of another 30 million people, and the payment for caring for them will be below our costs, uh, somewhere between Medicare and Medicaid. We're not sure where. So that's going to be an extra drain. So here's five things we have to face, and it's not unique to MD Anderson. <clears throat> now, what are the issues we have with the Affordable Care Act? It's a long list. I've boiled it down to a few. The first is the metrics. We're, we're going to be incentivized to deliver high-quality care, and we're going to be paid better if we deliver high-quality care. Now, the kinds of measures of what is high-quality care that are currently in place are things like, did the patient have to be readmitted to the hospital within 30 days after discharge? Did they have a high infection rate when, the, when they were in the hospital and things like that? Those are all very important, but uh, some of the people sitting in the second row here at MD Anderson are taking uh, an approach to trying to decide what would be the optimal metrics. And when we talk to cancer patients, guess what the first metrics is? Cure survival. Guess what the second, metri uh, uh, second uh, metric is? Duration of survival if they're not cured. These are the things we think we ought to be paid for. Rather, uh, I think it's important to avoid infections. Uh, it's important to uh, uh, avoid readmissions. But frankly, at MD Anderson, we admit patient, readmit patients within a, a month often because we have tried to take inpatient care and move it to the outpatient setting. And we will bring patients in and send them home or send them to a hotel and bring them back in and send them back and forth. It's much cheaper to do it that way than to lock them in the hospital for a month. But the incentive may be to lock them in the hospital for a month, and it's going to cost us more money. Uh, so these are things that we think have to be drilled down very deeply, and the government is in a hurry to get this out, and we're going to start seeing uh, metrics next year. Uh, covering our costs is a serious issue. Uh, maintaining the margins, I've talked about. And then there's bundling and risk sharing. And I'll, I'll get into bundling by moving down to this access issue. There's a tremendous uh, amount of discussion going on about creating accountable care organizations. And an accountable care organizations is a group of doctors and a hospital that work together as a team to try to reduce the costs of care while maintaining the quality of care. Uh, this is how we, we deliver care at MD Anderson, actually. We work in teams. There's the breast team and the colon cancer team and the lung cancer team. And uh, I think from that, we have that approach, but we can't take care of the whole patient, although we do during the time they have cancer. The accountable care organization is supposed to look into general prevention and hypertension and diabetes and all kinds of diseases. And we are very concerned that the wrong incentives will be put in place so that uh, the accountable care organizations will no longer refer patients to us. Right now, uh, uh, payers are willing to re refer patients to MD Anderson for care uh, for a co-payment. Now, if you think about it, probably 20% of health care in the United States is delivered at excellent specialized hospitals, like children's hospitals, which draw for, will have to draw from many accountable care organizations. Orthopedic hospitals that really specialize in hips or knee replacements. Eye hospitals that have expertise in that. Cancer centers all over the country. There's been no discussion, to my knowledge, of how to take this aspect of care, which is some of the best in the United States, in my opinion, and integrate it into the issue of how do you bundle people together and incentivize the complete care of a patient within an accountable care organization. I'll be interested in your opinions on that when we get to the uh, uh, question and answer session. 
Now, part of the solution to redu reducing the cost of care, in our opinion, would be sharing care. A place like MD Anderson, which has incredible expertise in complex things like bone marrow transplantation and uh, pancreas operations where uh, the, the operative mortality are at our institution is less than 1%, and in a good general hospital, it's 5 to 10%. That's the, that's the mortality from the operation, not from the cancer. Uh, we ought to be able to partner with physicians, and we're doing a good deal of this uh, right now, in order to take the, the most complex uh, aspects of cancer care and manage it and then refer the patient back home. And we have an internet uh, uh, address called My MD Anderson, and we now share our charts with our patients. We get patients from all over the country and with doctors all over the country, and uh, we're trying to, to develop this shared care as a way of saving money. So uh, when I gave my State of the Institution address this year, based on all the issues you've heard about, I'm challenging MD Anderson to figure out how to reduce its cost per patient 20% over the next five years. And I think this is something all hospitals are going to have to do because of the, what's happening that, that uh, Mike so nice, nicely summarized. In the short term, term, we're doing some things on that above list. That ad hoc institutional expense analysis committee has five subcommittees, and I'm going to see the first report in March. And I'm told that they've already figured out how to save $100 million uh, in, in improving our operations and making better use of our resources. Uh, reducing programs that are not mission critical but are nice to have, it's hard to do, but we're going to have to do that. The long term really uh, are things that I'm thinking more about uh, and are more important to me. Uh, understanding what our costs and utilization are. Uh, we order x-rays, uh, we pay for things uh, that we uh, think are helpful to the care of patients. We've got to decide what's essential for the care of patients. And we're going to have to cut down the tests and the, uh, the procedures we do to uh, what we think is uh, needed for patient care. We've got to get appropriate outcomes measures. Then we can begin to talk about value, and value, after all, I'm talking in a business school, is, is the uh, product or the outcome divided by the cost. Uh, I don't think most medical centers understand their outcomes or their costs well enough to address value as in the way a business would do it, most businesses. Uh, satellites and regional care centers are one way to approach the sharing. It's cheaper to deliver chemotherapy and radiation uh, out on Katy Freeway in a, in a small uh, uh, building adjacent to a hospital if any catastrophe happened, rather than bring patients into the medical center. End of life care has to be addressed, not by the medical profession, but by people like you. We spend probably close to half of the total cost of care in our lifetimes during the last year or two of our life. Now, nobody knows when that clock starts, that last year or two, and there are always patients that we know of that seem like they're end stage and end up living four or five years and seeing their granddaughters get married and on and on and on. But it's something we do have to face uh, in terms of cutting costs. Uh, I think the information systems is obvious but it's got to be uh, a uniform system all over the country. And I've talked about collaborations and uh, survivorship. I won't get into detail except to say that <clears throat> after five years, when a patient uh, is no longer on therapy, they needn't come to an expensive uh, clinic. They could, they could be seen off-site uh, much cheaper. <clears throat> now, if these actions that I outlined fail, uh, what will happen? We'll have to cut our growth, which is, again, demand-driven. Uh, we'll have to reduce our services. We'll have to reduce our size, both the clinical and the research. And no one at MD Anderson's planning on this right now, but it is something that could happen to us and it could happen to any academic medical center that's dealing with the issues that I just discussed. So that's an overview, and I'm really looking forward to the question period. Thank you. Well, welcome to Rice, and thank you for joining us here tonight. Um, I'd like to start off with uh, 
you know, when people think about health care reform, I think the press has focused a great deal on the percentage of people who are uninsured in this country, and, and that's why we um, did health care reform. I, I tend to believe that, in general, we should be focusing on the health care cost problem. And as was mentioned, health care costs are now 17 percent of gross domestic product. As you can see from the line above me, this is a, a pretty straight line. So we're really headed in, um, in the wrong direction in terms of um, what we're spending on health care um, in this country today. And, and certainly Dr. Mendelson um, suggested that there are some, some very reasonable solutions that we can do to try and control these expenditures. So what I'd like to sort of say is, well, is this bad for uh, employers? Is it bad for the economy? Now, when you look at employers, what they're considering is the total payment package that they're handing over to their workers. So in order to get workers, they're thinking not just about the wages, but the benefits that they're purchasing. Health insurance benefits are a large component of that. So if that total compensation package rises, one of the things that they can do, of course, is choose to hire fewer workers. And that could be possible, but as you can see, there are other things that they could do. Um, they could pass on these um, costs to workers as, um, as lower wages. And certainly I feel like that's the case, you know, sort of, um, I don't know, say over the last 10, 15 years, I see these wonderful productivity gains in the economy. I think, ooh, I'm going to get this great raise. And then lo and behold, it sort of ends up being lower than I thought it would be, maybe because I wasn't so good. But, uh, but maybe uh, it turns out in part, in all those years, you would see that health insurance premiums were also rising and workers were paying for those premiums as well. And so that's where those wage increases could go. And then the other thing is that workers could choose, um, in some cases, not to offer health insurance. Uh, you know, if, if, they're, if they primarily cover low-wage workers, they'll just choose not to offer health insurance at all. So, so the question is, what does the research tell us about all this? So I'd like to refer to a study that came out in 2009. This is um, by some health economists in Southern California, both at RAND and at uh, University of Southern California, I believe, and uh, UCLA. Okay, so collaborative project. So what this does is it compares employment growth across various different U.S. industries, and each of these industries has um, different levels of employer-sponsored health insurance. That is, what percentage of the, the employers in these industries actually offer health insurance to their workers. And they were able to find data on 38, um, 38 industries where they could get good, clear data for this um, period from 1987 to 2005. Okay, and um, they, they did some bivariate, bivariate analyses, and I'll show you those in a graph in a minute, and they also did some multivariate regressions. And so, so the, um, the, different, uh, the different dependent variables they're trying to explain are employment growth, gross output, and value added. And they're going to look at how those vary across industries as a function of the percentage of employers covered by employer-sponsored health insurance and the general increase in health care expenditures that we've seen in each year, year by year. So presumably, if there is an employer who um, uh, is, if there's an industry where a large portion of the workers are covered by health insurance and health care costs go up, those premiums go up, and therefore they should be most pressed, for example, to be cutting employment because it's become so expensive to hire their workers. Okay, so let me, let me show this to you. And so, um, you know, I've got these three graphs here, so you can look um, first, uh, is this a pointer? Yeah, so, you, um, so for example, if you can look at employment here, and what I've got um, on the, on the, the uh, horizontal axis, axis is um, the, per, the percentage of workers covered by health insurance in this industry. And so you can see up, up around the, and it was, this was in 1986, and um, so, so they just took that as a baseline case, and what you're going to see is, is the, on the vertical axis the percentage change in employment from 1987 to 2005. So what you'll see over at the 80% level, sort of those industries that are, high, um, that are highly covered by health insurance, those tend to be, for example, Auto workers, whenever you hear about them, you know, sort of in a, um, a sort of a unionized labor agreement, sort of a disagreement. It's usually about health care insurance benefits. Um, interestingly enough, this is also a um, fair amount of these companies are, are in Houston because if you look at the industry uh, code for petroleum um, and coal companies, about 80% of their workers are covered by insurance. So, so those are the types of industries that you're looking at. And then on the other side, the low amounts of health insurance, that tends to be, for example, the retail sector and the agricultural sector. But what you see, what's important here is, is, is the slope of this line, okay? And what this is saying is as the percentage of workers are covered by health insurance rises and as health care expenditures increase, employment growth was lower. 
Okay, and this is, uh, this is holding all other factors equal. So it was, is done within the context of a regression analysis. You see the same downward sloping line for gross output by industry and the same downward sloping line for value added, which is some measure of output minus cost. So what these slides do tell you is that rising healthcare expenditures do get passed on to the entire economy. They get passed on in terms of lower, lower job growth and uh, lower output for our businesses in the U.S. Okay, so, so in case, you know, I, I know there are some, 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 some uh, strong card-carrying economists in the, in the audience who are gonna say, oh, this is all a function of what you specified in the regression. So I'm gonna, chose you, I'm gonna show you what they did. They, they cut the data another way. And I thought this was pretty clever. What you see on the U.S. side is um, what I just a sort of um, sort of a summary of the data I've showed you from the, the previous um, slides. This is employment growth, but they, they did it for the same industries they could match up in Canada on the right-hand side. And so the industries there, it's, it's sort of percentage of, percentage of you know, workers covered by health insurance um, in those industries in the U.S., okay? In Canada, um, health insurance is universal coverage. It's provided by the government. It's not at all you know, sort of provided by employers, okay? But you can see there there is no relationship, if anything, slightly positive relationship, but there doesn't seem to be any relationship between um, sort, of, sort of what goes on in these industries, okay, and, and, and relative to employment growth. growth. So what you're seeing is, um, that doesn't mean that we should be moving towards universal coverage by all means. There's plenty of other things that you know, factor into um, what goes on in terms of health insurance, but it does show us that you know, we, did, we did suffer in terms of employment, and that is something that has not happened in other countries. Okay, so then what they, um, they did in this paper is they, they um, did some simulations, and they, what they found is that a 10% increase in the growth rate of excess health care costs and that's cases where healthcare costs rise faster than gross domestic product. Every sort of 10% increase leads to 120,000 fewer jobs, $28 billion in lost gross output, and $14 billion in lost value added. All right, so if you think, you know, what does this mean, this 10% increase, that sounds like a lot. Well, if you think about it, what's happened in terms of healthcare costs, they've always grown faster than gross domestic product, and gosh, in the last last 15, 20 years. So for example, suppose healthcare costs grow by 4% and, um, and healthcare costs grow by 4% and gross domestic product grows by 3%. That's a 33% higher increase. And so that's, that's sort of multiplying these, these numbers lost by a factor of three. So these, this is a substantial cost to the US economy. Okay, so you know, how do I relate this to healthcare reform? I'd like to focus on um, uh, some of the things that are, that are being addressed in, in the Affordable Care Act to reduce health care costs. Um, there is a hospital readmissions reduction program that um, is predicted to save Medicare $8.2 billion. So if, if Medicare finds that your hospital in general is, is not doing so well in terms of a, a higher um, proportion of your patients come back to the hospital to, to get treatment, after they were discharged, you're going to get penalized in terms of your reimbursement rates, and that's going to result in the savings to the Medicare program. Um, there are going to be payment penalties for hospital-acquired conditions, and, and, and by that, I, I sort of say things like hospital-acquired infections. So if you're providing poor quality care, you are going to get lower reimbursements, and that's going to save Medicare money as well. Okay, predicted to save $3.2 billion over 10 years. Um, there are going to be bundled payments for renal disease patients, so instead of you know, sort of reimbursing for every single, you know, piece of equipment and visit and particular um, type, of, type of medication. We're going to offer, offer um, providers an, a, an efficient bundle that's going to control their expenditures and give them incentives to not be um, overutilizing services. And um, there's a, what Dr. Mendelson referred to as accountable care organizations. Um, which are predicted to save Medicare $5 billion over 10 years. And, and we can go into the discussion. I agree, Dr. Mendelson has a, has a, a very important point in terms, of, in terms of the fact that we haven't considered carefully how children's hospitals and cancer hospitals should be incorporated into the system. Um, I still would like to see it um, uh, sort of materialize in some form, and I think we, you know, that's a case where we should be considering some types of bundled payments. Okay, so what does this have to do with healthcare costs? You know, suddenly I switched over to Medicare. So, so generally I think the potential savings for the entire system okay, along with privately insured individuals, a couple things can happen. Um, one of them could 
be uh, that hospitals in the process of responding to these particular Medicare incentives are going to improve the quality of care that they provide to all of their patients in the hospital. And that will lead to better care and lower costs. Um, and the other thing is that my guess is that private insurers will see some of the mechanisms going on and they'll see which things work and they will adopt those reimbursement incentives within the private, um, the private sector as well. And so this could potentially um, spread to the, you know, the entire healthcare sector. And so in terms of the projected Medicare um, savings, what you see um, is, uh, is, you know, sort of the, the dark blue line is, is baseline Medicare spending. That's what the CBO predicted Medicare spending um, will look like over the future through 2019. And then with all the incentives, some of the incentives I mentioned in the previous slide, plus additional incentives that the, the Affordable Care Act will lead to the green line, which will be a slowing in healthcare expenditures, so that by 2019, we could see a, a savings in $100 billion in the Medicare program alone. And then you could multiply that by additional savings that you would see in the private sector. Okay, so that's, that's sort of, the, the view about afford, you know, the Affordable Care Act and what it could do potentially to slow down health care costs and, in, 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 you know, and following from that actually lead to um, sort of better productivity within the economy. Okay, so I wanted to talk about specifically what is going on in terms of different types of employers and the incentives that they're going to face um, from this. And, and you may have heard of this term pay or play. And what this means, the play part is either the employer participates in terms of providing health insurance to all of their workers, or they're going to have to pay a fine. So it's not just uh, fines going um, on individuals for not purchasing health insurance, but also fines that um, employers are going to face. And it's going to vary by firm size. So large firms are going to be fi uh, fined if there's no affordable coverage to full-time workers and one or more of their workers buy subsidized exchange coverage. And that affordability is sort of based on the, you know, the, the premium as a percentage of the worker's total income. And the fine is pretty hefty. So for these large firms, they're going to have to pay $2,000 per um, full-time employee um, who, who doesn't sort of meet some criteria. Uh, but you, can, you get an exemption on the first 30 workers um, who don't purchase health insurance. Okay? Um, and small firms are exempt. And so, so the, the health care reform does actually in, in have a number of incentives that help small um, businesses purchase health insurance. And uh, we can go to the, into those in the discussion, but I think they're, they're, they're quite reasonable. Okay, so in the process of that, what's going to happen as well is, is some of these workers who are um, in these firms can have the option of purchasing health insurance through exchanges. Okay, so for, that's for workers whose employer doesn't offer insurance. For example, if it's a, it's a generally low-wage firm, that could happen. Or where insurance is unaffordable, okay, they can buy um, insurance through the state exchanges. And Mr. McAllister referred to that, how we're going to end up with 51 of them. And it's going to be kind of, oh, it's good research for economists like me. I get to you know, study all these different observations. Um, and then um, also there's going to be, um, for um, uh, full-time employees with income less than 400% of the federal poverty level, um, they're going to um, receive a voucher to buy insurance through, through work or through the exchanges. Okay, so this is the part people, people are quite worried about. It could be potentially quite expensive because there's you know, lots of subsidies coming into the system, and that's the part of health care reform that is going to cost money. Um, and then Medicaid expansion to uh, the non-elderly, who are under 133% of the poverty level. Okay, so suddenly, um, currently Medicaid in, in most cases is sort of picking up um, health insurance for, for the elderly disabled plus, um, plus children and, and their mothers, but really now it's gonna be um, available to a number of you know, sort of single people um, living alone who did not have access to, to it before. Many of these who are workers. Um, so a large proportion of that population um, is working and is, is not able to afford health insurance. Okay, so um, there actually are a, folk, uh, a number of people um, in Washington, D.C. who've been number crunching, and so they've taken all that information that I've shown you on the previous slides and all the information they have in, in terms of elasticities of demand by employers and employees and elasticities of supply um, by health insurance companies, and they've sort of come up with this, with this predictive model. It's the health insurance policy simulation model um, run out of the Urban Institute. It was run in collaboration with the chief, um, chief health economist from McKinsey. Um, so it was a um, collaborative operation. But what you see here is predicted changes in employer-sponsored insurance. And what I hope you gather from this is really there's not much difference. 
Okay, you know, sort of total in millions, 151.6 without reform with the Affordable Care Act, 151.2. There's a lot of give and take. I just, you know, even, you know, the, that you should just interpret as no expected difference in um, the number of workers who are going to be receiving insurance through their employer. Okay, and they split it up by different types of um, firm sizes. Not much change there. In terms of how much employers are gonna be spending, Based on this predictive model, slightly lower, but I wouldn't draw any conclusions out of this. Again, it's a predictive model. I would say this is probably not much difference in spending between um, without reform versus with reform. You could start um, sort of raising your eyebrows for the, the medium-sized firms, 100 to 1,000 workers. That's where there's gonna be changes because those penalties on the margin, you know, they're gonna be facing these penalties and, and, and these tend to be the firms that are are sort of leaning towards not providing health insurance now and they're gonna to have to provide health insurance in the future. Okay, so just one note I'd like to say, say about these numbers. Uh, the reason I wanted to put these up and sort of say um, sort of not much difference is you may have heard in the press um, the former, um, former CBO head, um, Doug holtz -Eakin, made some predictions off of his own model which claim that health care reform would lead to such generous subsidies that we would end up with um, many people with employer-sponsored insurance dropping that insurance and moving and picking up government subsidies either through Medicaid or through health insurance exchanges or things like that. Um, but I thought it was really interesting reading the reports. He, he's a tremendous um, economist in general. He's highly respected. But he made some fundamental um, errors in terms of the assumptions of building his model, which led him to conclude that employer-sponsored insurance would collapse. And, and you can ask me about that later. I'm happy to tell you about it. But, but basically, if you, if you run these through a, through a careful model and think about it, we're just not going to have that much change in what's going on in the, in the employer-provided health insurance sector. So just want to say um, employers may spend slightly less on health insurance. Um, the number, number of people covered won't change much. Uh, I, I really think, you know, I hope those graphs I showed you get across the importance of health care costs um, to U.S. business. If you want to sort of know whether there's a consequence, yes, we're, there's a consequence and we're paying for it right now. And, and, and I really think uh, we would be much better off if we could focus on um, controlling these costs. And I think that there are some measures in the Affordable Care Act that induce health care providers to provide higher quality and at lower cost. And that's what we need in um, terms of improving um, the U.S. healthcare system and in terms of the U.S. economy. Thanks.